good morning to all of you, and thank you for attending this session. Uh, if you're thinking that this is going to be about uh, digital trade, you are in the right room. If not, you have a good chance to escape still before we begin. Uh, my name is James Lockett. I'm with Huawei Technologies, and uh, we are uh, delighted to have been uh, invited by ITSD to uh, moderate this, chair, this uh, session, a very uh, fascinating topic on the digital trade issues and the digital economy. So I want to thank all of you for, for coming here. I'm going to describe a little bit of the background, but first let me introduce our uh, excellent group of panelists. We have uh, just here uh, Martina Ferracane, who is from the International Center for European Political Economy, ICIPE. Very glad to have you. We're going to uh, make her speak first after I do an introduction, so she's ready. Uh, to her left, uh, Rupa Ganguly. Rupa is the founder and CEO of InclusiveTrade.com and um, very much on the forefront of inclusive trade. So we're going to have her perspective on, on the issues uh, related to the digital economy as well, and really as a practitioner on the front lines. So that'll be, that'll be quite interesting. Uh, next to her is Constance Ikoku from the Federal Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment of Nigeria. And so we're delighted to have a government representative, uh, and particularly one from a developing country uh, in, in Africa. So that is another very helpful perspective. And lastly, Pascal Canes, who is well known uh, as an advocate for the European Services Forum. Great to have you on the panel as well, Pascal. We keep meeting all over the world, so it's good to meet in Argentina. Um, Huawei is uh, very much involved in the ICT world, and we're uh, a, a large traditional e equipment manufacturer, have serviced, uh, uh, have become, in fact, the largest telecommunications equipment manufacturer in the world. But as we've been looking at the digital landscape over the last number of years, we decided that we needed to take a fresh look at how the, uh, the rules were serving us, servicing us. Because in the digital economy, as we view the landscape, and all of us know that, you know, since the GATT disciplines were updated in the early 1990s and the WTO came into force, we've had that set of rules, but we face a very different environment. And the simple way that I like to describe it is that we have analog rules for a digital economy. And so <clears throat> we began just to try to look ahead and read the literature and try to anticipate where things are going and what the needs are. And so we commissioned a white paper, and my, my, uh, one of my people on my team, uh, an esteemed colleague, uh, Simon Lacey, was commissioned to, to develop uh, and author a, a white paper. So um, we have that available and can uh, provide you a, a, a PDF access to that uh, later if you would like. Um, but our, our fundamental premise in that was to really look at what's been happening in the landscape, and all of us are aware, we heard in the last session, if you were here, uh, about many of the developments. So if we had been talking about this issue sort of 12 to 18 months ago, we would have talked about the exciting progress in the WTO on a services agreement. We would have talked about the TPP and the disciplines on e-commerce. We would have talked about the TTIP. We would have talked about RCEP. We would have talked about, uh, more recently, the G20. We would have talked about excellent guidelines uh, in APEC and in other, other areas. <clears throat> and what we have done in, the, in our white paper is to try to at least look at all the different guidelines and rules and proposed rules and uh, see how well they are suited for the advancing digital economy. But uh, one thing that we found is that a lot of the discussion, quite rightly, of course, is on e-commerce. But when we look at the digital economy, we look at it in a broader context because uh, all of us would recognize that you can't have e-commerce if you don't have proper ICT infrastructure. And uh, perhaps our friend from Nigeria uh, can talk to us about that. I was at uh, a, a regional WTO conference uh, hosted in Abuja uh, by the Nigerian government recently. And we were very much looking at that uh, fundamental premise that, that uh, the digital economy goes nowhere without proper ICT infrastructure as well as other infrastructure. But uh, there's so many other things going on in the digital economy that go beyond e-commerce. 
and uh, whether it's uh, you know the impact of the Internet of Things where all of our devices, all of our gadgets, all of our homes, all of our businesses, all of our cars, all of our transport, all of our pens, all of our eyeglasses, everything uh, is internet connected with millions and millions and millions of connections. Or whether we talk about artificial intelligence or robotics or virtual reality or 3D printing. All these are new technological developments that uh, we need to be looking ahead at and trying to understand the impact of those so that we don't in 10 or 15 years time, even if we manage to put rules in place today, we don't look back and say that we have really almost the same as analog rules for a digital economy because we have not anticipated where the technology is taking us. It's a very difficult job, but uh, that is one of the jobs that our panel, esteemed panelists uh, uh, today will be thinking of as well as just evaluating how are the rules working or not uh, for them. And uh, so our, our, our paper also examines all of those and looks at the evolving nature of, uh, of uh, uh, things and uh, you know, expresses some, some, some hopes and ideas. So we'd be glad to uh, make that available to all of you and of course to a, a wider audience. It's just been recently published, so uh, Huawei's uh, white paper on digital trade. But um, that's really just an introduction to, to get us uh, to talk about our our first topics and uh, with, with each of our, our panelists. So I'm going to start with Martina uh, directly to my left. And Martina is a, a, a senior researcher with the ICEP, I, <laughs> sorry, ICEP um, who's been very much looking at a lot of the restrictions and not, not necessarily in the entire digital economy but in some focused areas. So I wonder if uh, since you've been so active in in uh, tracking and map mapping the, uh, the different kinds of restrictive measures and identifying quite a number of them um, that are not necessarily admitted by uh, all of our WT members. Tell us really um, how urgent is the task, uh, we, we've got kind of a digital protectionism in some ways coming up, how, how urgent is the task of having disciplines on those measures that you've been seeing and um, maybe give us economic implications or what, what, what is happening uh, as a result of those things. So I'll turn it over to you, Martina. Thank you. And good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, sorry for being a little bit sick. I got sick on my way here. So if I say something stupid, uh, blame the painkillers that I'm taking. Uh, Actually, I think no. all, all, of our, uh, all of our panelists are sick. Uh, so <laughs> no, you're allowed only to have one question, one question per panelist. So e everybody is sick, basically. So it's, <laughs> that's a disclaimer. Yeah, so yeah, as you were mentioning, at ESI we have done, we have done a lot of research lately on uh, digital trade restrictions and actually if you are not aware of our new database that we launched last year, please have a look in our website. We have created a database of restrictions on digital trade. We cover 13 different uh, to topics and areas which go from traditional areas such as tariffs, trade defense measures, investment measures that we think affect digital trade up to new areas such as data flows, intermediate liability, e-payment issues, e-signature, etc. And what we found in this research, which took about uh, two years, is that uh, um, we analyzed basically about 64 countries and we found more than 1,500 measures which we think are restrictions on digital trade today. And, uh, and what we've seen uh, especially is that we are seeing a worrying trend of increasing restrictions, mainly in areas, uh, in this new type of, of, uh, of areas, um, such as data flows, intermediate liability, etc. cetera. Um, and I think one of the main concerns today are restrictions on data flows, actually. We found ab ab about 84 restrictions now in our database. And uh, we can see some of these restrictions as um, a, 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 pro, a, a very uh, problematic restriction on provision of services under mode one. If you look at, for example, a ban to transfer data abroad, you can consider this as a, by, as a prohibition for a country to provide services cross-border. If, if the only way for, for, for a company to, to, send, to provide a service to, another con to a country um, is to have an establishment in that country and to use a data center located in that country, we might see basically it's impossible for this company to provide a service under mode one. And um, I think that uh, addressing this um, and looking at how 
to solve concerns of countries and, and uh, eliminate restrictions on flow of data. Um, the only way of addressing this is basically to look at the concerns that countries have that lead the countries to impose these restrictions. And concerns that bring countries to impose restrictions on movement of data are not really trade concerns per se, but are concerns related to privacy, security, and uh, a very big concern is uh, access to information for law enforcement, etc. So I don't see how we will move forward in this and see binding commitments on data flows unless we start looking at why countries are imposing these restrictions and we start discussing in non-trade fora how we can address privacy concerns and similar concerns um, among countries. And so, yeah, I think this is uh, like something that we should definitely look at. And one important issue in this regard is, for example, modernization of MLATs. Uh, for those of you who are following data flows, like there is now a big concern of how countries can have access to data for law enforcement. And today, the way in which this is done is uh, uh, through MLATs, which are becoming really inefficient today in, uh, in the digital era. And I think that until we have a new agreement on uh, a new way of uh, exchanging data between countries, countries are going to be very reluctant to include any kind of commitment on free flow of data in any uh, trade agreement. And the EU-Japan agreement that uh, we, we just, uh, was just uh, signed, uh, well, actually that we just see this, the text now, is a clear example of how two countries which are really similar, that are now negotiating adequacy, have been unable to include anything on data flow. So if even Japan and the EU are not able to include a, a clause on free flow of data, we are, we are not going to see any other country uh, or group of countries today um, able to, to do like this, a step forward in this direction. Um, we saw this in TPP, uh, but yeah, we'll see if we see it in the uh, TPP 11. Um, so this, when, when it comes to data flows, which I think, it, basically I think data flow is uh, the most important issue to discuss today in terms of restriction on digital trade per se. Um, and there, I think the way in which we should address is like looking at legal and technical as, uh, implications of restrictions on data flow and look at whether we can talk between countries and look at, at whether these restrictions are actually necessary for achieving the objective that the countries have when they impose the restrictions, so privacy concerns, national security concerns, and security concerns, and whether we can look together at least less trade restrictive way of achieving uh, this objective. Uh, and another concern uh, area, which I think is very interesting, and uh, James was mentioning it, is uh, looking at all these new innovations which are coming today um, reg regarding 3D printing, virtual reality, blockchain, and similar innovations, which are extremely relevant, which are changing the nature in which uh, uh, the nature of goods and the nature of services. And I think there is still too little discussion on this on this topic in uh, trade fora. Um, just to give an example, there is a lot of speculation on 3D printing today, how this will uh, disrupt trade flows and change the nature of goods and services. Um, I think this is a bit uh, um, inflated, uh, this discussion. Uh, but I think that nevertheless, we should start addressing and discussing what are the implications of 3D printing on tariffs, on taxation, on IP, on liability, etc. And so, yeah, I think like these two topics, like data flows and new innovation, implication of new innovations on uh, trade are, are something that we should look at more closely. Mm. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'll come back to you, I think, maybe on EU Japan, because that's an interesting test case. So it might be interesting to explore that. Uh, Constance, I'm going to come to you next. But one of the things that we wanted to explore here, of course, and uh, you're uh, coming from one of the leading developing countries, is, uh, you know, there's often a perception that digital economy and digital trade is sort of a north-south issue. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe even big technology companies versus the rest of the world kind of an issue. So you get some of these political uh, statements and so forth out there. And so, uh, and I, I, I warned you what my question would be beforehand, so you're a government official. But, but you know, Nigeria has been um, a little hesitant in some areas of the digital economy, like the ITA, or uh, getting behind uh, negotiations on e-commerce, and yet uh, it's, uh, you know, Nigeria has uh, recently overtook South Africa as the largest e-commerce market in Africa, and as I mentioned, just hosted this uh, very significant event on uh, investment facilitation, uh, including ICT infrastructure uh, investment. So perhaps could you give us some insights into the current thinking of Nigeria to trade policymakers on on the broad spectrum of issues. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, 
I think the, the starting point is um, to say that uh, you're very correct. There are divergent views, particularly in Africa, concerning e-commerce and the digital economy generally. Some of them have raised concerns, uh, concerns that are legitimate, actually. There is a big digital divide, and um, this is an area that is fast moving. Um, whether there are rules or not, activities are going on. In fact, in Nigeria, for instance, intense activity. So governments are grappling with what is happening domestically and internationally as well. Um, so it's not an easy issue to, um, to manage uh, on, the, on the African continent, for instance. However, um, I think the position of the Nigerian government has been and is that um, we have to get in there. Um, you have to engage, you need to be at the table, you need to have a voice. And then apart from that, we believe that first of all, we have to embark on uh, structural reforms, a structural transformation, which enables you to be able to engage with the rest of the world when it comes to this subject uh, matter. Um, I, I think that um, we believe that it's an area that has the potential uh, to create uh, many jobs for our young people and uh, for MSMEs as well. So we do have um, a digital economy project that we are working on. And as you, James has said, um, we are working with a couple of countries. We are get, getting to coalitions, whether it's Friends of E-Commerce for Development, or friends of all sorts of coalitions that we think and we believe that we should be involved in in order to discuss the issues that are at hand and sort of find a middle ground, a middle way in solving uh, the problems rather than being at the other side. We see the challenges, but we also see the opportunities that are out there for our companies, for our MSMEs, you know, to engage in a global uh, economy, which we, we can't stop it. Whether we decide to fold our hands, whether we decide to, you cannot stop it. It will continue. So we, the way we see it in terms of policy making is to take actions, take steps that puts us in a position to be active in, in this sector. Thank you, Constance. Um, I'll come back to you maybe to talk a little bit more um, about uh, regional uh, action. One of the things in the conference we uh, co-host was ECOWAS. So it'd be interesting for you to uh, to tell us a little bit more about that. But I'm, maybe we could talk a little bit more about the friends. But we'll, first, we'll go to Pascal and then to Rupa. So Pascal, well known as a voice of business from the European services sector, um, and uh, you know you, you you're you're right on the cutting edge in terms of the business issues. What are the really urgent needs in terms of having new and binding? Uh, disciplines in the areas, uh, particularly obviously of your concern, services, uh, and where, when and where should we have those roles, and, and should they be anchored in the WTO? Uh, do we have expectations of plurilateral agreements? Uh, do we have negotiations being launched? Is it better to do it through FTAs uh, or regional, or what, what, uh, what are you sort of seeing in that realm, please? Thank you. Thank you, James, <clears throat> and thank you for the invitation. Maybe I'd like, to, again, to come back because we're saying words, and we understand these words very easily, but it is massive revolution which is taking place in terms of, of the digital economy. The free data flow is absolutely crucial for our world today, for the business. Actually, the world trade will collapse in one day if there is no two computers talking to each other in any single sector you can imagine. And today, the MC11 conference will not take place without significant cross-border data flow. <clears throat> think about uh, booking your plane. Think about booking your, your, your uh, hotel to come here. Think about um, <clears throat> the tourism in general and going to a bar in, in Buenos Aires to, to, to listen to tango. None of that will happen without, without cross-border data flow today. The payment, the payment between the, uh, all the, 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 the transactions um, uh, for the banks uh, are about uh, free, free flow of data. The planes, about the security, each engine in a plane have 1,500 sensors which are sending data, which are collected somewhere to make sure that if there is a place to be repaired or to be replaced, it is done in the proper time at the right moment without disrupting 
the chain. All of that is, is really about data. The whole logistics chain today is about data. For the shipping, for the truck, all our data <coughs> sent across borders. Uh, for the custom clearance, uh, all the containers, uh, that's about e-governance. It's not only about, about private sector, it's also the government which needs to be, to be engaged very seriously. And all of those um, e-commerce, that is the word which have been taken into the WTO uh, as, as a language. Um, for, us, for, for us, it's not sufficient. It, does, it is not saying what it is. We are talking about cross-border data flow. It's not only about B2C, so business to consumer, but the bulk of the data today, the very large part of the data flowing around is actually intra-company transfers of data and, of course, the B2B. So when we talk about industry for zero, uh, the Internet of Things or artificial intelligence, a bigger, a bigger process sending data people don't, understand, don't know about is a robotic artificial process, automa automation process, the, the machine to machine that I mentioned, uh, the digital manufacturing, all of that is taking place today. And as James said, it is true that um, we are living in an analog world for the rules, <clears throat> why we are going full speed into, into the economy and digital. So companies cannot operate globally without transfer of data. In the U, and I'm saying that both ways, uh, because a company which is having a server in a place needs only to send the data, but also receive the data, and barriers could be in both ways. Um, in the European Union, we have uh, in place now, uh, or actually next May, a general data protection regulation, which is going to be introducing even uh, stricter rules on uh, personal uh, so data privacy protection, but it is not preventing data to flow. You have some condition to do it, but in the EU, we have taken a proper obligation to allow data to transfer. But unfortunately, in many other countries, we are now ref uh, encountering new barriers uh, while it was no, no barriers at all, and now we're in, in introducing, we see introduction of new barriers on data localization. Data are required to be set into a server, or uh, you need to be, have a, a proper uh, subsidiary register in the country if you want to data transfer. And that is introducing new barriers, which is really an impediment to the development of the digital economy. <clears throat> so we would like to see some rules which would put some conditions to prevent these barriers to be erected. Where the rules should be, um, James, <clears throat> of course, the business world would prefer to have multilateral rules that all countries in the WTO will implement, because if you have in one shot all the world covered, it's easier. So it, is, it will always be our preferred route. Um, <clears throat> so there is this working program on e-commerce in WTO since 1998, and it is in danger. It is in danger in this city. It is not sure that the moratorium on duty freeze on electronic transmission is going to be renewed. That is really worrying. So if, even before going ahead for new rules, we're not even sure to keep the rules when we are put into place ourselves in the, in the WTO. And that is really something that we are, we are really a big concern. <clears throat> so it's not only the moratorium. You might have heard uh, yesterday the, general, the chairman of the General Council saying that countries have not been able to put a proper proposal to come here in Geneva. So they have eight proposals on the tables. All of them have very interesting issues, but because it is not sufficiently mature, we might actually end this conference without any rules at multilateral level. And that is something that we certainly would like to encourage to have rules at multilateral level, uh, because that is something the best way. If it is not going to happen, um, why don't we try a plurilateral route? So, we have uh, on the table uh, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which were with 12 countries. As you would know, uh, the US have now decided to withdraw from this agreement. There are still 11 countries on the table. They nearly finalized the decision to uh, conclude this TPP, in which you have an electronic commerce chapter with very advanced rules on data flow. And that is... Uh, the, some, the, these chapters um, we are certainly in, in support of. We wanted to uh, expand these rules through the TISA, Trade in Services Agreement, negotiated in Geneva, although it is not under the WTO ages, uh, auspices, but <clears throat> they're also because of, uh, uh, first of all, the, the US elections, the, the, the ministerial of the TISA to conclude the negotiation, to tell you that actually the negotiation was very much advanced, 
uh, have been uh, cancelled, uh, the, the ministerial has been cancelled on the 9th of November, i.e. the day after the election of President Trump. But it is not only on the US side. It is true that on the EU side, we also have some issues to solve on this chapter. And therefore, unfortunately, for the moment, I don't think the plurilateral route is an immediate option. Maybe TPP might, might come, and, and that is something we would certainly support. The other, way route, in the, the other route is indeed uh, the bilateral trade agreement. So uh, can we try to introduce um, rules to, to uh, put uh, preventing erecting new barriers on, on electronic commerce and data flow. We have done uh, that. The EU would like to do this. Uh, we haven't got it in EU-Japan. We haven't got it probably if we finish before the end of this year, EU-Chile. There is a placeholder. So the EU, within the European member states, are still not able to take a proper position on that. Um, it is not because the EU is protectionist. It is because there is a fierce discussion between some member states and also some people within the Commission who don't understand why we need to have rules on data protection in a trade agreement. And we tell them, no, we don't want to negotiate data protection in a trade agreement, but we just would like to make sure that when a government is going to introduce a new data protection regime, they should not use this as an excuse to erect new barriers and prevent foreign companies to do business in their own country. So not to put it as, as a trade barrier. But on the EU side, those who are really uh, defending the privacy side, they say, no, 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 no. We have in the European Constitution, so it's not exactly the term, but in, in our rules, uh, uh, the fact that data protection, data privacy is a human right, a fundamental human right. And therefore, not a single government shouldn't ever be obliged to justify that they actually protect data privacy. And therefore, it is a possibility, and we, have, we can see already, Colombia has adopted, uh, uh, with a full face, uh, willing to prevent, to, to, to set up a new regime on data protection. But in there, they say, oh, we're going to co copy the European examples, where you need to have a democracy regime. And therefore, all countries which would not have a sufficient protection in their own country would not be able to get data. But that is not the way the EU is doing. Yes, we, we have opened as a possibility that a country to have full data flow between the EU uh, and getting access to EU citizen data, uh, the EU will analyze the data protection regime in their own country. But we have also offered other possibilities, binding corporate rules, standard clause. So that is only one of the aspects. But in Colombia, in the text, it is actually said, your regime is not adequate, provided that you have a regime. You cannot, data, you cannot trade the data of, of Colombian citizens. That is a proper barrier. So that is only one example, but I stop here. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we'll come back to some of those questions. And um, I may uh, in, invite you to explore plurilateral a little bit more with me uh, when, when we get going in a second. But let's, let's go on to Rupa. Uh, so Rupa, um, you're our entrepreneur on the panel and Indian background now in the UK, but you're doing a lot of work really trying to bridge the developing world and the developed world in a particular context in textiles and so forth. So tell us a little bit more what, what inclusive trade is and also in your experience now out in the field, what sort of rules would be helpful so that you could get the Myanmar's and the Guatemala's and the so forth as you're gonna explain what you've been doing uh, more involved in, in, in e-commerce and digital trade. Thank you. Thanks, James. Um, so thanks very much for the opportunity. It's, uh, so we're an, an e-commerce platform called inclusivetrade.com um, where we retail um, fashion, lifestyle, and home products. Now, my background is actually trade and development where I started at the WTO, went on to work with um, various technical assistance projects in the UN, and um, so worked a lot with SME businesses globally in trying to, to connect them to markets. Now, one of the things that you think when you sort of start um, working on your own business as an e-commerce platform, you think, you know, you've done trade and development, you've worked with trade rules, you have some idea about an understanding of tariffs and regulations. But interestingly enough, um, e-commerce comes with its own set of, um, well, challenges as well as, well, opportunities, obviously. So the thought behind um, inclusive trade was to bridge the gap between small suppliers, artisans that we came across in various countries around the world, and the consumer, such as you. And how could you have access to these beautiful products um, globally at the touch of your fingertips, literally? Now, 
it's easier said than done, obviously. Um, one of the things that sort of stops us is, of course, your ability to know that they exist. That's the first thing. Second thing is, how quickly can you actually access them? And thirdly, do you actually trust the system that you're working with? I mean, meaning whether it's a platform or whether you're, you're interacting directly. Now, obviously, I'm sort of simplifying this down to the level of, you know, how a consumer behaves every day. But behind that, you have a number of different issues. So we work with countries like Myanmar, we work with Guatemala, we work with Peru, we work with Ethiopia. Now, as you can imagine, um, every country has a set of different trade rules. And while you may or may not be a WTO member, there are specific diff tariffs that you, know, you're, you're, you have to deal with. So if I warehouse products in the EU and then distribute them, and you're a consumer sitting in the United States, this in itself creates a number of issues for me. Data protection is one of them. Privacy laws is, is, is like a Herculean nightmare right now for us. And that actually inhibits business. So if we had clarity to start with, I mean, we're new to e-commerce ourselves, right? Even though we worked on sort of trade and development, worked with small businesses, e-commerce is a, 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 a part of business that is growing so fast that while we're sitting here, things are happening. I mean, I'm sure you've all heard of the words blockchain. You've heard somewhere, you've heard of Bitcoin. And you know, all of these things in, for many of us is just sort of, a, oh, it's something going on. No, it's not just going on. The trillions, and I mean trillions in dollars of business happening this very minute. So if we don't understand how we can jump on board and how we can use these opportunities to actually benefit, whether you're an SME, whether you're a consumer, how can we make life more efficient? So very simply put, Logistics. I mean, let's face it, trying to get a product to you today, if you were sitting in, well, Buenos Aires is one thing, even if you were sitting in Geneva or, you know, and I was warehousing the UK, trying to get you that, you know, let's say a pair of socks or a bag would almost cost me 25 euros, one product, logistic costs, yeah? And that's only within Europe, the continent of Europe, not saying EU, but within the continent of Europe. Try now, when everyone talks about SMEs coming on board, and you know, e-commerce is this amazing thing for SMEs to jump on board and, and you know, harness the, the benefits, you've got to think about business has to think differently completely because the cost of doing business can't be so high that it doesn't make sense for you to actually do the business. I think what we're learning and we're coming closer and closer to understanding is that if there isn't some sort of a regulatory is a big word, but some sort of a harmonizing framework, if you like, whether that's the WTO, whether that's bilaterals or regionals, if there isn't transparency in how trade actually would be conducted when it comes to working online, with offline goods, because physical goods eventually have to go from place, you know, from point A to point B. If you're a digital good, if you're, you know, music, or if you're um, a ticket that you're buying online, that's still, you know, you don't need a physical thing. But if you're going to buy a pair of shoes, you're going to buy a bag, it is a physical product, and that has to go from point A to point B. So harmonization, e-payments, for instance, how do you actually pay that supplier? And there's a huge thing about mobile payments, which is, which is something that we're working with. But again, it's, it's, it's so niche, it's so small, that if I want to pay my supplier sitting in the Inya Lake region of Myanmar, I actually have to incur 35 pounds per transaction, whether I pay you one pound or if I pay you 100 pounds or a thousand pounds. So then, does it really make sense for me as an online platform commercially, and I'm not talking just as a development charity, I'm talking about commercially, does it make sense for me to engage with that small supplier? Pure answer would be no, but there are different ways of going around those. So I think what we want to find is actual solutions that take into account the issues that B2C business, which is very different from B2B business, and the aspect of online commerce, which is completely different from regular trade and commerce. Okay, a lot of material there and some very interesting examples. Um, uh, yeah, uh, in, we talked yesterday about rules of origin. I may come back to you on that. That's another um, fascinating mismatch uh, of things. But let's go back, uh, Martina. So I wanted to pick your brain just a bit on EU-Japan. A lot of people who were following that negotiation thought that well, this is sort of TTIP round two, um, because the Japanese had agreed to TPP, which is sort of the American view of things, together with their 11 partners. And that had 
fallen apart uh, for various reasons. But EU Japan looked like a second uh, attempt to sort of try to do TTIP without all the American political stuff involved in simple terms. Um, but what's, what's happened there? Because it was an interesting attempt to try to get the European regulatory system to match uh, the TPP stroke US type system. And it doesn't look like we got there. Yeah. Tell us what's happened. Is, um, yeah, it's, it's quite interesting because indeed there are no much sensitivities between the EU and Japan, so you would expect that uh, a lot of things uh, were going to be agreed. Uh, but in fact, we see very little in the e-commerce chapter. There is uh, like the the, the, the the easy things like e-signature and uh, were included in this uh, e-commerce chapter. Uh, but then when it comes to a more complicated thing, the only commitment we see is on source code. Um, we still with uh, quite a, a lot of exceptions uh, when it comes to public procurement and uh, security, etc. And then basically what was agreed is that in, within the next three years, these two countries will engage in some sort of discussion on free flow of data. So there was uh, basically um, the incapacity to be able to commit to free flow of data, despite the fact that uh, um, if you're following the discussion between you and Japan, the two, the two uh, the region and the country are discussing adequacy decision under the, um, the, the EU privacy regime. So basically Japan might be the country number 13 to be considered adequ adequate under EU privacy rules. So this means that data will be free to flow, f private data will be free to flow to Japan without any restrictions. But despite this, and still uh, there was not enough um, yeah, room for, for an, an interest to include this, uh, this, this uh, commitment on free flow data. So, yeah, it's, uh, and, and, and Japan was clearly pushing for this kind of uh, clause in the, in the agreement, but yeah, the sensitivities in the EU are still too high. Uh, and would you agree with Pascal on some of the sensitivities where some of the fault lines lie? I mean, you agree with his assessment, or yeah, can we yeah. have a fight up here? Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I, I totally agree that, that we have this uh, big concern about the privacy being uh, like human rights and then like there's basically is, is a fight of uh, uh, an emotional fight in terms of uh, what like the fact that we can't discuss privacy in a, in a freedom agreement, which is uh, I totally agree with Pascal that we can find a way to make data uh, flow freely and still make sure that privacy is always protected when data flows, flows abroad. Uh, but we need to start con to keep discussing this outside FTAs before we would put any clause in FTAs agreement. So we need at least from the EU side. Um, in Asia, the, the discussions on this are a bit more advanced, but in, from the EU perspective, there is still not enough agreement between different stakeholders and actors um, to feel confident to include such a, such a commitment. Mm -hmm. okay. And I would love some of you to ask her some questions about the findings they have on uh, the, all the different uh, digital protectionist measures. So I think we need to explore that, but I get only one question for you. Uh, Constance, uh, coming back to you on, on the initiatives that Nigeria as a, a leader in the developing world and in Africa uh, has been taking, uh, I wanted you, if you could, to explore a little bit more what you've been doing regionally with ECOWAS, which I found was quite interesting when I was in Abuja recently. And then um, you know, your Friends Of, which are not regional, but really are, are global amongst a, a mix of partners. I mean, um, for instance, regionally, um, we have been negotiating the Continental Free Trade Agreement, um, not only within ECOWAS, but the whole of, of Africa. And um, this is very crucial for us because we have discovered or we've known for a very long time that um, trade within Africa is very uh, infinitesimal compared to with the rest of the world. So if we're going to industrialize, if we're going to develop, and if we're going to create jobs for our people, um, we have to trade uh, very much so within the continent. So um, Nigeria has been sh chairing the negotiating forum for the CFTA, and um, I'm, I'm delighted to say that it's been going well, and we're hoping that by next year there will be a document to be signed by African heads of state. Um, this is not too far from what is going to be happening in terms of the digital economy um, and, um, and, and, and that space because 
conversations around there will continue between technical groups of what do we do, how do we provide the soft and hard infrastructure that is necessary to boost this sector within the continent, uh, both inside the individual countries and continental level as well. And I think that if we're able to organize ourselves on a, a regional basis, then it's, it's easier to, to um, negotiate as a block with other countries. And then that is why also we've been interested as a country, Nigeria, to discuss with countries of like mind on a plurilateral basis, where we think that it makes sense and we, uh, we can get results from it. We are aware that the WTO um, sort of process on negotiation has been deadlocked. And um, a lot of people feel like yeah, we're in Argentina, but we may not get much results from this. So for instance, I would say that the Friends of E-Commerce um, for Development, Nigeria is part of it, and um, Nigeria together with Japan and other countries in this group submitted a joint ministerial decision for the establishment of a working group on e-commerce for structural dis discussions to examine what rules might be necessary um, in this area. So we're just talking and discussing with different groups you know, and s trying to see a way forward um, out of uh, the logjam. And at the same time, concentrating on our national interests and what we need to do at home to make sure that we are ready before we are able to get on the war stage out there. I don't know if that explains. No, that, that, that's very helpful, thank you. Uh, and your Abuja declaration on investment uh, facilitation, I think, is also a nice step forward. You had a number of countries uh, um, signing on to that. Yes, so. I mean, the, the, the group called the Friends of Investment Facilitation for Development, Nigeria is part of that group. And in fact, we had a breakfast meeting yesterday, and 38 countries, more than the, the original members, adopted um, a statement supporting um, a structured decision, um, a structured w decision to find um, ways to move forward on investment facilitation between countries. They had hoped to place it on the WTO agenda. Um, that's the, the ultimate goal. In fact, Robert Azevedo, the DG of um, WTO, was there yesterday and sort of um, supported the fact that countries are coming up with these issues and it's gaining momentum um, and it's gaining traction. And we're actually discussing the issues that matter and trying to see um, ways that we can find solutions to the problems rather than a deadlock which takes nobody anywhere. So Nigeria is very much interested in the digital trade agenda and very much interested in discussing with countries to find solutions to uh, the problems that we face. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you say that. I've, I've found Nigeria really to be on the cutting edge of uh, leading on some of these issues, and it's a government that's realized that this digital divide that we see is one that's growing, uh, and uh, you need to be on the right side of that divide, and the only way to do that is to take effective action. So congratulations to your government. All right, Pascal, I'm going to put you on the spot. You're Mr. Plurilateral. Um, sounding a little concerned or even skeptical, I may say, about results that we could see here. Now, uh, I, I, I like uh, international things, so I'm going to draw the Olympic flag for us, okay? Everybody loves the Olympic flag. All right, so in, in, uh, in this space, we have the United States with one circle, and they are in favor of uh, uh, a free and open internet, right? Uh, with exceptions carved out for national security. So they've, they've got the national security, but everything else should be open. Then you've both of you have described the European circle, the next circle in the flag, uh, with data protection and privacy restrictions. So they're also, in a sense, op a fair and open internet with, with another set of exceptions. And you have China, which is a different uh, fair and open internet, uh, with perhaps uh, state security as a principal concern. Uh, so that's a different one. Although, Objectively, it looks actually a little bit similar to the United States. National security and state security, shock, 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 uh, may not be all that different. Um, but a plurilateral agreement has to have critical mass. So you need to include some other countries. So you would think that countries like Brazil, India, and other major markets should be part of that. So Brazil is a fourth circle in our Olympic flag. Uh, really with economic uh, nationalism, sort of an economic nationalism or maybe a development uh, exception. And perhaps 
uh, India as sort of economic nationalism, a different different variant than than the, the than the Indians uh, than the Brazilians. But you got these five circles, and like the Olympic flag, there's some overlap in the middle. So is that the sweet spot for a plurilateral agreement with five sets of exceptions? Um, over to you, sir. <laughs> well, that's a tough one. Thank you. <laughs> well. Uh, on the U.S., I think we have to admit also that uh, they have always excluded the public procurement spot. And, and, and to believe that the U.S. is completely fully open, I think, is, is not true. We have to say it. On the EU side, we are open. There is no restriction except that you have conditions. And it is true. I can understand fully uh, what Pupa said. It can be really a nightmare for SMEs. <clears throat> now, there are companies working to, uh, for, uh, to sell a one-shot so that it's going to be possible to adopt this, this legislation. Um, on China, uh, the, st I, I, the state security that you mentioned is true, and, and, and it is very complicated for foreign companies to set up. But the fact that if you want to do business in China, i.e. if you want to get access to 1.5 million consumers, you have to give your source code supposed to be on a cyber security basis, it is going too far. And some companies have decided to, take, to go out, which is really uh, uh, something which is uh, detrimental to, to global trade. Um, <clears throat> Brazil and Latin America uh, uh, environment, uh, so far the Mercosur have not been part of any plurilateral. Uh, we are hoping maybe even this week, that we have a discussion, a uh, finalization of the Mercosur negotiation between the European Union and Mercosur uh, for a trade deal, but there also data flow will not be part of, of the deal. And finally, India, um, which is the country where you have the, the big IT and big e-commerce and big um, telecommunication, uh, the WIPRO and, and all of these uh, uh, Tata consulting and etc. companies which are very much into the, the IT engineering etc. Uh, the, the backbone of making the infrastructure working, uh, apparently the government doesn't want to engage with other countries uh, to move into a multilateral environment on, on, on e-commerce. Uh, and, and, and I can understand this development I mentioned, they don't, they don't want to, to allow uh, all countries to go uh, at the same speed, but companies will go. The world will happen. Digital trade is happening. And we simply don't understand why India and other, in particular in the African Union, are thinking that, no, no, we prefer not to be engaged in. So I'm, I'm very much um, happy to hear about this, this uh, platform, uh, and, and uh, I hope that something will come out of it. I think if a result of this conference would be that, indeed, we take a commitment not to have binding rules now, but to discuss, to continue, and not to, to continue the deadlock, but to have a platform where all countries would put all issues on the table and discuss, uh, I think that would be already a, an achievement. Uh, but we need, I mean, if we want to keep the WTO as we know it, it's a body which is setting rules. So apparently the time is not right now, but we hope that by discussing we'll be able to go further. Now, plurilateral, you mentioned we have TISA. Will TISA be resurrected one day? I don't know. I don't think it's going to be possible without having the United States at the table. At the table. Uh, but we in, in uh, European Services Forum, we have, from the very beginning, really uh, um, debated and we wanted to have the TISA within the WTO framework. We wanted to have a TISA open to everybody. And you will take the decision whether the critical mass will be there or not at the end of the negotiation, not at the beginning. It is not because one country is not in at the very open that actually will not be willing to join at a point in time, depending on the result of these discussions. And I agree that it is true that, yes, well, China and India will never join an agreement if they are not participating to the writing of the rules. Well, it's open. Let them come. Uh, but not take, take a decision. It's going to be an FTA, i.e. Uh, Article four, uh, 5 of the GATS uh, excluded uh, from others. That is not the way to go, I don't think so. But now uh, the best chance of the plurilateral, uh, where we will have some rules on, on data flow, is indeed the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. 
Um, but it is true the United States is not part of it, so none of the big countries that you have mentioned around the table there in the, in the Olympic flag is going to be part of this. But that might be the first international agreement we have standards on cross-border data flow, so we need to watch at it. Uh, sure, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I think that uh, it's interesting because I think we can get a mass as long as we address the reasons why countries now are imposing and are refusing to have any kind of d discussion on free flow of data. And so you have like one group of countries which are looking at it from the economic perspective, like industrial policy perspective, and they are imposing these restrictions because they would like to attract uh, investment from companies that create data centers, etc. And when it comes to this, what we have to do is uh, discuss this openly and say, do these measures really help the country in creating data centers, etc.? And when it comes to ISAI, we've done a lot of research on this, but still we are the only one that really have done some macroeconomic research on this issue, and we have found that uh, in the long term, actually, the country is, is losing out a lot uh, by, 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 by obliging companies to use local data, data processing services. And I think if we have a more clear discussion, more research on the actually cost for the economy that comes from these measures rather than the, 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 the short-term benefits, then it would be much easier to negotiate this kind of uh, clauses. The other concern is then something that we could look at gut, is like guts exceptions, like privacy, security, et cetera. And there, what we have to do again is like, to look at, to pose the question, do these measures really help privacy? Do restrictions on data flows in, as, they are, as they are defined and they are uh, um, de basically written, actually make data more private or help the country to feel, uh, to inc in increment or improve cyber security or national security? And so I think there is really, the only way to move forward is to really have an open discussion on whether this is the best way to make sure the countries feel safe or protected or they feel the data to be private. Mm, very good points, thank you. Okay, Rupa, let's come back to a couple of things. Um, in most trade agreements pay lip service to SMEs. Um, but from what you've been reciting to us, you're not seeing that much of a benefit. I mean, could you talk to us about that? And if you want to discuss a little bit on rules of origin or other omissions that, uh, or, or, or complications that you've seen as well, feel free. Um, so I think when it comes to SMEs, I think a lot of rules, um, trade rules today, have been sort of made with sort of keeping in mind multinationals or big companies. Although everyone says SME development, and let's face it, all the technical assistance in the world is geared towards SMEs, um, somehow, uh, that's another debate completely, there's no real focus on understanding what an SME really needs. Because if you did understand that, then you would actually turn a lot of trade agreements on their heads. Because none of that really does, I'm not saying none of it, but essentially a lot of it doesn't count towards how an SME functions. So simply put, let's say there is a woman who has great embroidery skills. She sits in um, Ethiopia, just as an example. And she wants to sell her product uh, to you in, well, let's say the United States, as an example. So you've got the AGOA rules, you've got, uh, you know, I mean, first of all, does she know about that? And how can you actually reach out to her for her to understand that? She pretty much falls through the gaps. So, you know, it's really difficult for starters for her to know that. Secondly, um, even if she did know about AGOA, when she starts going about with actually exporting that product and getting money for it, what forms does she fill out in terms of the rules of origin? Where did the yarn come from? Where did the cotton come from? And when we talk about global value chains, she's just doing the embroidery, but let's assume that the T-shirt actually came in from China. Now, what is the rule of origin on that? You know, the con consumer in the United States, he or she, is, are they gonna actually pay the tariff? Are they not gonna pay the tariff? Now, is this woman supposed to know that? Or how is she supposed to know that? I mean. Has anyone actually asked that question? I know this sort of comes about as a rhetoric every time, but I haven't yet seen simple, clear answers um, which are provided to the people who need it the most. So when we start working, and we're working now with about six different countries, and already that's a nightmare, <laughs> so I don't even know how it's gonna, we have a, a, we intend to go up to 20 in the next year, so fingers crossed there. But essentially working with uh, a lot of these small businesses trying to understand what rule of origin is, um, is determined by that product. 
is in itself quite challenging. Because, I mean, let's say now the product has come and it's warehoused in the, in the European Union. It then gets exported to a consumer, uh, a B2C consumer, in China or in the United States. Now, let's say there's VAT, which is another issue in itself, which there's no harmonization on, and God forbid, that's one of the biggest nightmares for most businesses. And being digital, when things happen literally at, you know, at the spur of the moment, you don't have time to react. So VAT is a huge issue, but tariffs in itself, customs officials, and I'm not going to say which country, but at this point in time, I can tell you a developed country had a huge issue in the recent past, just two months ago, in clearing goods uh, purely because they weren't aware of a certain trade agreement. And thereby, um, well, imposed a massive tariff, held the goods for 48 hours for no rhyme or reason at all. Now, when we talk about all these agreements happening, whether they're being discussed um, regionally or they're discussed bilaterally or the WTO, multilaterally, I think there's a huge case for technical assistance and trade facilitation, but in the true sense. And when I talk about that, you need to engage with people in the business. If you really want to benefit the SMEs, first of all, define who they are. Who do you want to get out to? You say MSMEs. I mean, that's like, you know, a random statement because MSMEs can mean anything. Is it one person, five people? And what kind of business are we talking about? What are they really doing? So I think there needs to be a lot more focus in terms of um, which country. Start with one region, maybe. That might be a better solution as compared to thinking of a global solution because we don't agree on things. Nobody seems to agree on the same thing. Simply put, I just found a very interesting statistic the other day. Um, 19% of China's overall retail has been online, 19%, compared to just 6.7% in Japan, right? And this is online shopping, online sales. Um, the projection for e-commerce sales by 2021 is 4.48 trillion US dollars, right? It's 1.86 trillion by next year. That's the projection. So if we're talking about this massive space, massive opportunity, and we think that this is a potential, indeed it's an opportunity where if a small business can have access to a market through an online platform, then obviously they can access consumers all over the world. But what's the cost of doing business? How can trade facilitation actually support a small business? How can you reduce the cost of doing business? And how can there be more transparency? I think transparency is a key issue over here, which I think even trade officials sometimes don't have the true answers. So especially when you've got three countries involved with global value chains, even for a small business, because the embroidery is happening somewhere, the yarn is coming from somewhere, the fabric is being spun, um, fabric is being woven or knitted somewhere else, and the final consumer is in another country. All of that in itself complicates matters when you start saying global value chains. Because, I mean, what rules apply? Which data protection applies? Um, who's responsible? And who's actually accountable? So I think if you don't start addressing little issues, we can't get to the bigger picture. Very well said. Thank you so much. Pascal, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I want you to, to, to jump in on, on what the EU is doing for, for the SMEs. First of all, I'm always making this, this remark when I talk about SMEs. What is the point to make an exception of the rules for 99% of the companies? I mean, the SMEs treatment should be the whole agreement by itself. I mean, an agreement is not done for multinational companies. It is done for all companies. But it is true, we need to better explain. So what the EU is doing in their SME chapter is not only lip service. It could be seen as, that, as such, but if you go a little bit deeper and trying to find out the information, the EU uh, is established in, in their own trade agreement they do now. <clears throat> they invite uh, the other party and the EU doing the same, of building a website where it is helping the SMEs to understand the rules. So to try to have a one-stop shop where you can find all the information, not only for the EU to want to export in the other country, but also now this export is also this export help desk is also for companies from the other countries to where to find the information in the EU on rules of origin, etc. Unfortunately, I mean that is very good and that is necessary, and we, you need to go in there and, and, and find a solution. And you also, if it is not in, you can complain so that it's going to be fed at, at a point in time. But that is gathering, that is essentially information on the rules of origin and the tariff and etc. It's basically nothing on services. 
because apparently service is too complicated. But services is about 80% of our economies in developed countries, and services is about 30% of our trade, in, if, if only on, on, on a balance of payment. So um, now we are, we are calling the European Union also to help the, the SMEs in services, because 60% of SMEs are actually in the services sectors. So there we would like to find a tool to also give information quickly to the, to the, to the small and medium companies. Uh, and one of the way, if we don't want to reinvent, we have the, in the EU a market access database, which is essentially in goods. If we don't want to reinvent the wheel, maybe we can use the um, STRI index of the OECD and the World Bank uh, database on, on regulation, which is not perfect, but at least it is directly new to the, right, to, the, to the right tool to say that is a regulation in that country on your sector. But then how to better exploit a trade agreement uh, implementation is, is, is a big question mark still. Okay, thank you. Uh, could our friends get uh, microphones? Because we've got about a quarter of an hour. I'd love to get to your questions. We have so many uh, experts here in the room. We have one, uh, one, two, already some questions coming. Can we get a microphone? Did you have one or you're just scratching your head? Just scratching your head. All right, the lady in red here. Let's start, start here. And then you do have one. Okay. Irina Tividad from the U.S. Rupa. Uh, on U U.S. And, and, and what? Tell us your name and your, oh, and your I association. Am, yes, Good, I'm please. the president of Globe Women Research and Education Institute. Uh, the story you've told about the challenges that SMEs face that want to enter into e-commerce is <laughs> uh, incredible. So I'm curious, how did you get around them? Knowing the cost of logistics and tariffs and VAT, are you profitable? And if you are, what are the lessons you can extract from that that you can share with others who are trying to get into e-commerce and as an SME? And Pascal, you may have the information online, but trying to teach an SME uh, person <laughs> to look online, understand it, and deal with those rules, forget it. It's not going to happen. Uh, and to um, Constance, what infrastructure did you set up to enable Nigeria to be e-commerce ready? Let's uh, take a couple more questions. Got the gentleman just handy right here. We'll come back to you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I'm uh, from the Conference Board of Canada, uh, Ottawa-based uh, research organization. I have a question for Ruba. Since you are the business entrepreneur, I was wondering whether you think it's time for gender equality issue to be in the trade route making process now. So in particular, given the current uh, situation. And also our question, uh, services, um, Pascal, you mentioned about this TISA negotiation. I think the European position, according to the private sector and uh, your foreign, you say you want to be open to all the WTO members. I understand that, but in that case, think that uh, how about China and uh, India are those uh, important players to be part of the TISA negotiations, or they don't want it, or they just do not admit it. Another related to trade is services negotiations. I want to know a little bit about from private sector perspective, how about the uh, mode five in the future to be part of the rulemaking process in the future instead of other mode one, two, two three, four, and four. Thank you. Okay, let's get the microphone. The lady back here, if we could... And then we'll, we'll, we'll circle back around. We'll get all the questions, and then we'll uh, have, the, have the panel answer. Which one? Sorry, uh, there's a lady just there. Yeah, thank you. Hi, my name is Nivedita Sen. I'm a researcher at the Graduate Institute in Geneva. Uh, my question is directed towards Mr. Pascal. Uh, I, uh, despite the EU GDPR, I think there is a push for certain countries like uh, France and Germany for data localization norms in particular areas. So I think even within the EU, there is a tendency to push for data localization norms, perhaps. How would you respond to that? Okay, good. And uh, gentlemen, let's, oh, we've got, okay, we've got quite a number of questions, but uh, let's, let's take those two and then we have three over here. So that'll be eight and then we'll have to close it there. There's two back a little bit further. Raise your hands again, please. Yep, there we go. Um, my name is Johannes Kleis from uh, the European Consumer Organization. Um, I have a question for Martina. You, um, you mentioned that uh, because of um, 
the concerns that um, that some countries have when it comes to privacy or access to information that um, at the moment binding commitments on data flows do not make sense and that they th those discussions should maybe happen outside of a trade agreement if you could maybe elaborate on um, how you see this happening what kind of um, um, what kind of um, fora this could be and, and, and what, what should be out, the, the outcome of this. And maybe just one thought in link to that. Um, Pascal mentioned um, um, Colombia's uh, new rules about uh, um, um, data protection and the, the, the requirement for an adequacy agreement. Now, you can also see it from the other way. I mean, the other way around. If you, if you look, for instance, um, um, if you take the EU, if you take countries where the EU has an adequacy agreement with, like Canada, Argentina, Uruguay, uh, Switzerland, Israel, maybe soon Japan, they might all be able to have an adequacy agreement with, with Colombia. Then you, you talk about millions of, 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 of people. So that is quite a big trade block. So in that sense, for those countries and, and millions of businesses in those countries, the Colombian trade rules, they're not, they're, they are not a barrier to trade. Uh, the gentleman back there, please. You can pass the microphone over. Thank you. Hi, my name is Michael. I'm with the South African business delegation here. Um, I, I, I'm trying to understand how, why we think it's so easy for developing countries to just jump on this bandwagon. We have not, as developing countries, seen any kind of substantive commitment to, 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 to Doha. In fact, it sounds as if, in plenary, we, we, we'd prefer to pretend that Doha never existed. We, we, are, we, we know the story of how, um, when, when I spend $100 on, a, on an iPhone, how much of that actually ends up with a manufacturer as compared to ends up with IP. The, the, the bottom line big challenge here has to be, are we as developing countries only going to see ourselves painted into a corner, getting less and less revenue stream, being more and more, more, and more marginalized? Is it really true, as Pascal has, as Pascal has said, that we, 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 we are actually not making rules for 80, 90 percent of, of trade that is happening, but we fundamentally end up, when we start talking about trade, trade rules for a digital economy, we fundamentally end up with, with rules that are there for those who are ahead of the game, those who are ahead of the pack, those who know how to make money out of the deal, those, those who have advanced economies, and then we're suddenly going to find one day that when we, when we start trying to, to establish all our rights, as the U.S. has done, they pull out of, uh, they threaten to almost virtually pull out of WTO. They've pulled out of the Trans-Pacific, and 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 as soon as we as soon as we see those 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 massive multinationals being threatened, we actually, as developing countries, as the MSME sector, start seeing less and less happening in respect of respecting the the kind of trade rules that that, that we are looking at. So we, we're rushing into this thing for rules for rules' sake, without actually establishing how it is going to help the those economies and those sectors of economies that, that, that really need to be growing if we want to take multilateralism seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Let's get over here. I think we had one question over here in the back somewhere. No one raising. Okay, let's. Okay, the, we have two, two gentlemen here. Let's take those two questions. Or three. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Felipe Sandoval from ICTSC. Um, uh, one question on um, what do you think would take for China and some other countries from Africa and Asia to be able to pick up on the uh, no, not yet concluded agenda of the TISA, whether in the form of the TISA or in any other shape? Okay. Gentleman here. Well, uh, thank you, Peter Kierkegaard from the Confederation of Danish Industry. Um, this whole discussion on, on data flows uh, sometimes gets a little bit abstract, um, <laughs> which is why I like the examples that Rupert had. And, and I maybe just wanted to add another example for the benefit of the crowd, because one of our member companies, they produce uh, hearing aids, a uh, world leader in hearing aids. And, uh, and what they do is they, um, they sort of measure the inner ear, of course, of, of the patient or the consumer, depending on how you look at it, um, which is, uh, is basically data that is then transmitted to a plant in Poland where they make a 3D model of, uh, of the inner ear. This model is, is then shipped to the, uh, to the country uh, where the consumer is, which could be anywhere, basically, in, in Japan or in India or Africa, wherever. 
um, and they are then working on or are able to uh, remotely fit that hearing aid uh, so that it so that the consumer doesn't have to go down to a shop and actually have the hearing aid sort of calibrated to fit the inner ear. So they are, they are basically able to remotely fit it at home with the patient or with the consumer. Um, and of course, all of this involves data that flows across borders. Uh, and some of it you could even characterize as uh, personal data, uh, even health data, which raises a number of concerns for this company because as it is now, it's relatively simple, but what they're of course concerned about is that uh, states will start regulating this in a different manner around the world, meaning that they will have to do one thing for Japan, they will have to do another thing for the US, they will have to do a third thing for Mercosur area, etc. So of course, what we're looking for or trying to get is we want some multilateral rules on this issue so that there is a, a level playing field because else companies will need to uh, have very, very sort of uh, specific supply chains for individual markets and basically consumers will suffer for higher prices. So thank you. Thanks for the contribution. Daniel, microphone's coming to you. Hi, and thank you for the interesting panel. So my name is Daniel Crosby, and I work with a law firm in Geneva called King & Spaulding. And I am the chairperson of Business for E-Trade Development. Um, and I guess I wanted to pick up and ask a question on uh, Ms. Farrakhan's point about what data flows mean for existing commitments uh, when you said on mode one, how, if you don't allow data to flow, how do you respect existing rules and, and commitments uh, and the national treatment the same way. And, and as a kind of parallel to that question, I wanted to give India a shout out because I think uh, we'd like to ask what you all think of India's position at the WTO officially from this year is that the existing rules cover everything and existing mode one commitments cover all data flows and mode uh, one commitments must mean that you can't have local servers or it will violate national treatment. Absolutely straightforward. So the title of this presentation presumes or you want to achieve binding disciplines. But w what do we say about these existing uh, di disciplines and particularly the, the very advanced position of India where it's trying to protect its own interests uh, has huge interest in data uh, moving and saying that we don't need to even negotiate because the c current rules cover everything. Okay, very good. We'll have to close the questions there. And uh, uh, the panelists, you've each got one or more questions. Try to keep your answers two to three minutes if you could. That's a challenge, but uh, let's respect the time. Pascal, I think you had the largest number of questions, so we'll get you the first shot. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, I think there are two questions, uh, our friend from Ottawa and Philippe, uh, about extension of TISA to China and other countries. Um, so it's, it's always a question of the critical mass at a point in time. Whether there are, two, there are two ways to it. Either we will go for a WTO-wide rules, and probably it has to be at a lower level than the TISA. Uh, so maybe, and I'm, I'm sure many countries, including the United States and others, would prefer that we keep a high-level rules in TISA, which means that if China is not able to, to adhere to these rules, it will not be able to join in. So that is a choice to do. So that's the reason why I think it is interesting to have two tracks. So if we can have all countries in the WTO adopting some minimum rules that everybody would agree upon, that would be already a first thing, instead of, of being deadlocked. And then for those who are willing, willing to go faster and higher, let them go along as long as it is not detrimental to the multilateral system. So that, I think, is, is a dynamic behind, behind the, the two speeds uh, of these things. <clears throat> uh, on, on the fact that um, in Europe we have uh, possibly some countries who want to uh, erect new barriers and the data localization requirement, uh, unfortunately, that is true. There is this tendency. Uh, I don't think it is coming from Germany, but it is definitely coming from France. Uh, and they sometimes hide themselves behind the data protection, data privacy. So it is not completely clear. 
And there is some protectionism behavior where they say, okay, it's going too fast, we don't have any national champion, we have to, to slow down the procedure so that at, during this time that the rules are not adopted, we can have our, our uh, national companies going further. I don't think this is a solution. Uh, clearly, uh, all those companies, it is not, we're not talking about the GAFA, it is not about the US companies invading the world. We're talking about the world trade. It is not about B2B. It is, you know, it is not about B2C, sorry, only. It is really the whole data. And, and that, is, that is the infrastructure, like Huawei for the terminals. We need the telecom companies. We need the, the iClouds. So it is much, much beyond this. And these things are happening. And in France, you have big, very, very interesting companies doing a lot of uh, ap applications for all of these, and they are well ahead of many other countries. So I think this behavior uh, is, is not appropriate, and I hope it is not, gonna, it's not <clears throat> going to continue. On the mode 5 issue... 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Uh, I think the mode 5 issue, so for, those, for those who don't know, it's actually the services around the products. The mode 5, if we go deeply into this, is actually about removing tariff on the services part. I don't think this is a solution. It's going to be very complicated. And as far as I'm concerned, it is not a service issue. It is a rules issue because you need to go to the tariff negotiators to, be, to ask them to remove the tariff on the services part. That is not, for me, of, of, of big interest. I'm much more interested to ask all multi um, manufacturing companies to focus on where their interest is. It is not only about reducing tariff, it is not only about reducing the rules of origin and the difficulties, but it is actually they have to fight to have more one commitments in the services part for their own sectors. So to be sure that when the services are incident to manufacturing, you have a proper mode one commitment. Because then your mode one saying covering, that is not completely true. In all trade agreements, the mode ones it is sector by sector. In most of the, of the treaties, on the horizontal part covering the, the rules, it is said these rules apply only for the commitment taken in the commitment, ta taken in the schedule of commitments. Therefore, we need also to focus on the more one commitments. Thank you. All right, Constance, two minutes, please. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the infrastructure to get Nigeria e-commerce ready, I think that the first thing to say is that um, we had to recognize that um, there is a lot of activity in this area, and so we need to have a national strategy to deal with it. You know, 15, 20 years ago, nobody was talking about this. So I think that is uh, very vital, and it's, you know, a really huge step for us to get it together. Then the second thing that we recognize uh, through our research and our studies is that the biggest problem for companies, both MSMEs, uh, is broadband <coughs> penetration. And which we don't have. We have over 170 million mobile phone users, but um, internet penetration is still a problem. Um, there are issues of licensing which the government doesn't, didn't previously want to give away. So we're looking at getting the private sector to participate in this area, um, getting competition, because once you get in competition and private sector can sort of get involved, you drive down the prices, um, you have larger broadband penetration, and then there's affordability, there's also consistency, there's also availability there. So that is, those, those are some of the things that we're working on. And then um, the right regulatory framework also for e-payments and things like that is part of the things that uh, the government is working on in order to encourage uh, that sector. I want to also uh, make um, a comment on uh, the issue raised by the gentleman from South Africa uh, in terms of rules that are already been made and you think that it's for those that are ahead of the game. I mean, people are very concerned and worried about that, but I think that the most important thing is that you get engaged. Um, you know, what you have, you've said may or may not be correct in some areas. So get engaged. Um, whether we make the rules or not, rules are going to emerge uh, through practice and customs in the long run. So it's better to get in there and negotiate and sort of have your voice heard in the whole process. Yeah, hi. Um, Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, um, thanks for your question. So uh, yes, it is challenging, but I think for us what has worked is that this isn't something that we just 
woke up one fine day and did. It's been five years since we've been working actually with um, trade and development, in fact, to answer slightly both your questions um, on gender equality. So we have a nonprofit organization called Spinner Circle, which we've had globally working and documenting and actually bringing women entrepreneurs and their skill sets and specifically small artisans as well on board, understanding what their skills are about, what they require. So we've been doing this whole research and analysis for about five years. And at the end of that, actually, e-commerce came about as a response, as an enabling factor for bringing products to market. Because we did have pop-up events. We did have physical um, events and activities across the world. And, you know, it's expensive as well to keep doing events from one place to another. And e-commerce, after looking at the costs and benefits, um, working with existing people that you know, relationships and collaborations. I think the key for us, I suppose, and one has to see uh, over the years what happens. It's an organic growth process. So I can't say 10 years from now, you know, how it's going to be. Um, what has worked for us is really collaborating collaborating with a lot of different players. We can't do it on our own. And if we think we can do it on our own, it's, it's, it's a myth. As an SME, as a small business ourselves, and working with so many small businesses, the key is to work with collaborators and working with people in trade and development, law firms, working with banks, working with um, fintech, which is finance and technology. So we're looking at various innovations, being a part of these discussions. And that's actually how you can be innovative. Because otherwise, the cost of innovation by yourself is, is is, is, is impossible. So for us, actually, the reason why we've come up with um, inclusivetrade.com, uh, the whole idea is to bring the back end to the front and to engage with customers by looking at how you can shop by impact, which means if you buy a scarf, what's the impact it's having? And how is that, having a how is that actually changing the lives of someone? So we've documented these processes over a while, and we continue to do that. It's not the end of the road, obviously. But that's how we're able to reduce some costs, because we're not starting from scratch. We're actually taking something and then going using e-commerce as the next step. So for us, that's how it's worked. Talking about gender equality. Right. Uh, we'll have to stop on okay. gender equality. As passionate as I know you okay. are on that topic. Right, all right. Well, gender <laughs> equality, just to say in one line, yes, of course. I mean, you can't leave 50% of the world out. So obviously, that you've got to have both sides on the table. All right, Martina. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to try to address everything in just one single um, answer. Um, I think it's like, let's start by looking at why France and Germany are expressing concerns. And I've actually been living in Germany and really see how much request there is from public authorities and by the government to keep data being processed in Germany. And, uh, and there, the discussion is really emotional. I was actually reading the answers to the public consultation of the EU on health data, and you can really see how Germans are really strong about their privacy. People were really writing in this consultation, I never want my data to go online, ever, never, for any reason, like this health data. So if you are in a country which you have this side, uh, these people saying these things, and then you still have businesses, of course, interested in every business, it's really hard for, for a government to position themselves in terms of uh, how to negotiate um, yeah, free flow of data, in a sense. Um, and this goes also to the example on 3D printing and health data. I, I, think, I think there we went really far really quick and internet has brought a lot of convenience and so we were really quick on going to the internet but now there is all this uh, backlash of people saying actually this has implications and we should address these implications uh, otherwise we are never going to have people engaged in supporting this. Um, and how do we do that? I think there are different levels of discussions. We have to engage with citizens to clarify what really it means to move data across border and how uh, the rights of citizens are ensured and protected when data flow freely. But also we need to, to discuss with the other countries on on what it means to, to have data processed abroad. And there are a lot of concerns about uh, cyber espionage, surveillance, etc. So there is another kind of set of discussions on how to make sure that data can, can, can flow freely and being protected when going abroad. And just the last point um, on existing commitments, I do think that existing commitment on GATS are applicable apply on uh, movement of data, and we might not even need any extra rules on movement of data because this is, this is about cross-border services, uh, provision of services. But what I think is that now, given the old sensitivities on this, what people will say is like this falls under exceptions, and I will think that the first thing a country will do is say this is under security exception, and there is going to be really hard 
start with any kind of, uh, of yeah, solution of any uh, dispute if, if countries just uh, claim that uh, restrictions on data fall under security exceptions. So I would rather look at how we can address this in, uh, by discussing uh, and, and solving um, these concerns outside uh, trade fora before we go into uh, this kind of discussions. So thank you, everyone. We have to wrap up here. I'd like to thank uh, Martina, Rupa, Constance, and uh, our friend Pascal for some very insightful, rich, and sometimes provocative uh, statements and uh, some excellent eight questions from yourselves, times a few uh, that we've done several times. There's clearly a need for further education on many of these topics. We have some bridges in terms of knowledge. We have some bridges in terms of what is necessary to make it happen. We have some bridges in terms of understanding where the technology and the, our economies are leading us. But I trust that this uh, presentation today has been instructive, at least in highlighting some of the issues for you, and uh, we'll certainly be having additional uh, discussions. But let's thank our panel. Thank you very much.